clock is showing noon, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Hannah Dorn. I'm the marketing manager here at Ward Laboratories, and I'll be our moderator today. Um, we are excited to bring you part one of our webinar series, Soil Health, A New Approach. Um, this is part one of three, and we hope you'll come back and join us for the next two. Um, we have a few slides to share with you today about nature's function in soil, and then we'll go ahead and use the rest of the time for questions. Um, please ask your questions either in the chat box or in the question box. Either way is fine. Um, if we don't get them all today, uh, be sure and come back for part two. We'll continue answering some of those questions there. Today, our panelists are Willie Pretorius, Patrick Fries, and Zach Wright. Willie is our soil health consultant here at Ward Labs and brings a wealth brings a wealth of experience in soil health practices worldwide. Patrick Fries is a soil scientist also at Ward Labs and is defending his PhD in soil science. And finally, Zach Wright owns and operates Living Soil Compost Lab LLC, where he focuses on soil microscopy. So we'll go ahead and dive right into it. Patrick, do you want to go ahead and put those slides up? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Looks good from here. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for the intro, Hannah. Thank you. All right. Everybody ready? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, just give us a brief overview and tell us why this is important in the context of soil health analysis. Um, regenerative agriculture is based on the concept of farming in the image of nature or mimicking nature. We must therefore get some understanding of how nature functions. What are the characteristics and functions, uh, how the characteristics and functions are maintained, how nature function, uh, functions, and and what, what, what a stable uh, environment looks like. What does nature look like and by what, by what characteristics can we recognize a stable ecosystem? Where a stable ecosystem is functioning properly, all the soil functions are working at optimum level and so are the water cycle, the nutrient cycle, the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. And by understanding these functions and cycles, we can design testing methods to measure these efficiencies. Can we just move to the first, to the, to the second slide? Um, this slide depicts uh, four pictures, which in, in my view in, is a perfect description of beauty in diversity. And that is what nature looks like when it's, when it's in a stable condition and all the, fun, and, and all the functions are, are operational and, 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 all this, and, and all the cycles are operating at, at, at nature's pace. Yeah, the uh, optimal part is the, uh, the understanding and testing of these efficiencies, uh, mostly because nature has done, you know, the million, millions of years of R&D uh, in terms of uh, how these systems work and optimizing uh, these exchanges at the lowest, uh, the, with the lowest energy possible. And so understanding the, what promotes these services uh, will drastically minimize the, the inputs required for um, uh, agricultural practices, so which is one of the benefits of regenerative ag. Absolutely. Understanding, you know, the, what are the indicators of a resilient system? So there's a multitude of ways that we're looking at that now via microscopy, via um, traditional soil testing, and then um, into some new territory of testing. So. So we hear so much about soil health these days. Is there a definition for this concept? Uh, yes, Hannah, uh, all, all the definitions of, of soil health eventually address the same major issue of, of functions and, and health as the indicator quantifying the ability to perform these functions, which are generally guarded as the following, the ability to infiltrate water, the ability to retain water, the ability to resist erosion, the ability to sequester carbon into stable humus-like compounds, the ability to house the soil microbiota, the ability to protect the host plant from disease and the ability to provide and cycle nutrients for the associated host plants as well as them as well as the microbial communities it is an it is interesting to observe that the first five functions are all are all facilitated by aggregate stability 
you know, we can't really define it as one thing, which is sort of uh, has sort of been the historical approach in soils is that we try to compartmentalize a, a bunch of it, but uh, we have to tackle it as uh, how each of the parts of the system work as a whole, uh, primarily how the biological and chemical work components work towards the physical, which will ultimately return uh, to support the efficiency of the first two, kind of like as a cycle, but kind of understanding uh, that cycle, how it functions um, uh, holistically. I grossly describe how I look and view soil in a microscope is as a microhabitat. I'm, I'm visually viewing what the visually viewing. I'm looking at the habitat of the soil, of the compost, of the system, and then really looking at the bottom of it. And then that, how that expresses, you know, higher up in you know, the order of the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, um, there's a lot of correlations between the two. So all those things working together makes for a resilient system. Absolutely. Uh, Willie, could you elaborate a bit more on how nature's resources are transformed into living entities? Um, yes, Hannah, the interesting thing is that 96% by mass of the elemental building blocks that make up living organisms originate from the atmosphere, the carbon, the nitrogen, the hydrogen, and the oxygen, while the soil contributes only 4% to the rest of these elements, which can make, which can make up more than 60 minerals as, as, as depicted in, in, in the slide, of which we only have a few, uh, but the the, the jury is out on exactly how much is required, and it is, it is, it is generally con uh, uh, viewed that almost all the, all the elements of the, of the periodic table is required in, in, in a healthy system. The, the importance of the small, of, of, and, and other, one other interesting thing is that above, the, above one acre of, of, of land is 35,000 tons of nitrogen gas. That's, that's interesting. The importance of this small minor soil fraction is ever enormous in the context of human health contributing factors and an important discussion for, for another day. Uh, this is where soil health, plant health, animal health, human health is connected. In modern day breeding and new cultivar selections has however in many instances eliminated the need for many of these micro and nanonutrients. This is an important topic in the bigger scheme of regenerative agriculture, as we do not only want to regenerate the land, but also the food that is being produced and should be considered for inclusion into the newly established regenerative certification schemes. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to, to think that 4% uh, uh, is such a small amount uh, where a lot of the nutrients come from, but that also explains why uh, micronutrients are required in such small doses and even slightly above that can become toxic. So uh, being mindful of, you know, how uh, nature utilizes those small amounts, why they're required um, and how to sort of promote the system uh, where they can access these uh, because they're all in the soil. Uh, it's just very small amounts. And that 96% that the, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen that makes up all living systems, that includes us humans, which I always stumble on that statistic myself. And it's very relatable to, you know, exactly the things that we're trying to grow and cultivate. So um, yeah, it's pretty humbling how much importance that 4% of the mineral component is um, in putting that back into our food systems and assuring that it's in our food systems. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important, assuring that it's in the food system. Yeah. And I think that's where, that's where we've gone horribly wrong in the past or at, at present. Absolutely. Yes, it's all connected. So how does nature put this model together? Um, Hannah, it, it puts together with life in, in the form of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa, arthropods, earthworms, and, and, and many more that, that make up the soil food web. Each one of these perform extremely important functions in nature's, in nature's model to maintain all the soil functions that are referred to as a soil food web functional groups. In other words, each one has a specific function within the soil food, food web. And then soil can only be studied as a living system in association with the plants that grow in it and the microbiology that live inside it and below ground. The only reality about soil in isolation is that, that is the inherent components of silt, sand, clay, minerals, and organic material, all the dead stuff, or the resources that the associating life 
plants and, and microbes have at their disposal as the building blocks to build and create the, the, the functions as described above. Yeah, historically, we've looked at soils as almost this sort of inert material, even organic matter is just sort of a, a carbon-based substance, but um, it, it literally is the, the living interface that uh, sort of marries the non-living components below ground, the non-living components above ground uh, to create this very rich uh, interactive environment that can go on to support even more complex life plants, which will in turn uh, support us. Um, and then ultimately all this goes back into the soil. So it's kind of amazing how our lives uh, kind of revolve around this, this living material. Absolutely. Producers, you know, they contact me because they want to help, they want help with the biological component of their soils. And so uh, recently it's just occurred to me and kind of re-reviewing -re what I've learned years ago in school about the five kingdoms of life. You know, we focus so so greatly on the plant kingdom, which is one out of the five kingdoms, or maybe the animal kingdom if you're a livestock producer. But through a biological approach and a biological awareness via testing, via what we're putting out to our system, you know, we're really putting in the missing sort of three kingdoms of life, the bacteria, the fungi, the protista, and bringing that all back into the fold so they all can work together in this cohesive ecosystem. Um, so the importance of our living organisms in our living systems, I, I think is paramount to where we're at with our production agriculture and understanding what we even have to work with. Yeah, uh, just a reminder, we've got some questions rolling in, but keep, keep asking those questions in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of these few slides here. <clears throat> so can you guys talk a little bit about how all of these processes are linked together? Yeah, soil, soil happens to be the, the link that brings all these building blocks uh, together. It provides the minerals, the 6% the, the or, or the, 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 that we spoke about, the, the vital components, uh, uh, vital minor, minor components, but very, very important. It provides, it, 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 and, and it also provides the biota, the, the living quarters for all the soil life. It allows for water and rain, rain and irrigation to be infiltrated and stored, and it allows for the nitrogen gas from the atmosphere to penetrate the soil. So it brings all these components together uh, on, 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 on this, on, in the soil. It's a, yeah, essentially a, a, a currency exchange for services. Um, I guess you would think about uh, like an energy currency, um, carbon currency, things like that. Uh, but they transfer these in exchange for the things that they need, uh, both from the microbes and then from the plants. Um, and it, as a whole, will support the, the sort of robustness of these uh, living systems, and then in turn will support us. And like I had mentioned earlier, where I'm, uh, you know, in a microscope, we can view our soil, we can view our compost as a habitat to itself, and what lives in that habitat, what can feed off of that, within that habitat. And so personally, I, I, I think humus is a very fascinating concept, this sort of amorphic material that we can build, we can actually recompose our carbon into, um, and essentially turn it into a flywheel to make more nutrients available in our soils to uh, benefit this long-term habitat that should be our soils. Yeah, Patrick, I love how you consider it to be a, a currency exchange where it's truly yeah. goods for services within that soil system. I'm just like humans almost, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All this is happening below our feet. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have not yet uh, talked about a hot button topic, and that is carbon. How is carbon important, and how does it enter into the system? Yes, um, carbon is extremely important, uh, probably the most important element uh, on, on, on Earth as far as life is concerned. Carbon enters the, the, the system through the process of photosynthesis that kickstarts the whole life building exercise, the most important process on planet Earth. The carbon flows are, are directed at synthesizing the sugars to carbohydrates, to leaves, to stems, to fruit and, to, and, and roots, and all the above and below ground stu structures, while it, also, it, while it also exudes a substantial amount of, of, of photosynthate through its roots to feed the associated soil, soil micro microbiology. 
you know, so elaborating on the, the currency analogy I mentioned earlier, carbon is essentially the currency um, of living organisms and it helps facilitate the exchange of these nutrients and services. Uh, since carbon makes up a bulk of the exudates and sign signaling molecules and sugars and things that the microbes consume to do the work and things that they, the, the messages that they receive from the roots to, to do the work. Uh, so it's, it's sort of this, like I said, a currency exchange. Um, it's kind of interesting how it goes from sort of a somewhat simple system to something that's much more complex. So it's just kind of fascinating if you think about it that way. And carbon was, I guess, in my interpretation and how I present it with the people I work with is you use it or you lose it. And in using it, you capture it, you fix it, you stabilize it. And that's largely via microbiology. So it's very important that we start to really understand the function of healthy biology in our soils. So you, you talked briefly about some root exudates, but what is the relevance of those root exudates? Uh, yes, Hannah. Um, technically, there's been more than 150 different uh, compounds uh, been identified, ranging from sugars, amino acids, phenolic compounds, and, 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 and others. Uh, these exudates serve, serve as a range of, of, of have a range of purposes, such as sign as a signaling agents uh, to attract the relevant microbiology, as a food force to feed these 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 microbes, and as a defense system to fend off uh, pathogens. And therefore, each plant has a very specific fingerprint of exudates, and uh, which relates to the microbial community it it requires for for its association and and and. And, and living and for future living. Yeah, so we're gonna go to the next slide with the- Great diagram. This is, this is just a, a um, this slide just provides visual substantiation of the quantity of carbon-based exudates flowing from the roots using C14 image, imaging and X-ray technology. And from there, you can see that it's quite a substantial quantity of, uh, of, of carbon that is, that is released through the roots. Yeah, I love this, uh, this diagram or this uh, picture image because you can actually see based on the aerial differences from the red and blue that it, act, it actually, like you said, uh, comprises a, a large area uh, of the root system. Um, and it's kind of interesting because we also try to historically try to mimic some of these root exudates in some of our analyses. So for example, the, the DTPA analysis that, you know, sometimes you'll see on your soil reports for your micronutrients, iron, manganese, copper, and zinc, um, that essentially tries to mimic uh, a root exudate. So it sort of chelates or grabs some of those micronutrients. So we've been aware of some of these things for quite a while. It's just sort of, we're getting much more information now because of newer technology, we can actually see some of these uh, uh, some of these different sort of chemical interactions, but uh, the amount that the plants are exuding is, is amazing. I concur. <laughs> I think we could talk on a whole presentation just about root exudates. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's going to be the one of the forefronts of a, a lot of work, um, just because we don't know really a whole lot about them. Um, we do know some, but uh, our, our methods of analysis are much more advanced now. Um, so in nature, we don't see mono, monocultures and with regenerative agriculture, it is um, of course very important that a diverse mix of cropping species and cover crops is incorporated into the farming system. Uh, talk a little bit about why that's important. Uh, yes, Hannah, as, as we discussed in the, in, in, in the previous slide, each, each plant has its own specific fingerprint of uh, micro, micro, uh, microbiology that it, that it needs for its survival and, it, and, and its exudate is obviously the fingerprint of that. So each, each, each species has a very specific fingerprint requirement for its, for, of, of micro, for its micro, microbial community. And need and 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 therefore we need to increase species diversification to obtain uh, microbial di di diversity to perform all the soil functions. Uh, different plants have a different root configurations and different microbial fingerprints, uh, maintained by a unique combination of sugars, other signaling exudates, attracting their own, own unique microbial community. 
So each one of these guys is a, is, is a, is, is a, has a different fingerprint with a different uh, microbe. And each one of these uh, microbes actually, they, they cohabitate with, with each other and, 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 and two, two different plants will, will, will complement each other in, in, in performing other functions. So it's like a, it is, it's like a factory that you, that you have. Uh, and if, so if you only have one plant, you only have one division of the factory in, in operation. So the, that's, that's, that's really an, a good explanation of why diversity is, 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 is such an important thing and, and why nature survives only in, in, in diverse, with diverse communities. Yeah, it's like you said, like the, the, each plant has its own uh, exudate fingerprint, but then also exudates are emitted in response to you know, environmental stressors. There's like seasonal fluctuations, um, growth fluctuations uh, in terms of you know, the, what they'll exude. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, like Willie said, the diversity is required because uh, you, you know, holistically uh, make the system more robust uh, because the, the network and the roots, they all, they all um, uh, benefit from that, from the exudates that others will exude. So it's just uh, what we see in regenerative ag, why diversity really uh, helps quite a bit. It's the spice of life. Yep. <laughs> I love the analogy of the, the factory workers. It doesn't feel any good to have only one assembly line show up to work every day. Yeah. <laughs> be no, able that's to exactly create a that, finished product. That's exactly right. That's that's why the uh, maintaining your your functional groupings with within the soil food web is 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 such plays such an important role. Each one with within the system up up and down the 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 uh, um, uh, system of, of 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 from lower to to higher species, but they they each perform very very specific functions. Um, so uh, another popular topic um, that we hear a lot about is mycorrhiza. Um, how does that fit into these microbial communities? I uh, yes. Uh, Probably one of one of my favorite topics, and probably one one of the most important components of, of nature's system. It serves as the connection between the, the plant roots and the vast tonnage of insoluble minerals that can that, that it can mine, uh, with the help of its helper bacteria. Each each one of these uh, uh, mycorrhizal species have a have have have, have helper bacteria that, uh, that 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 assist them in. For instance, sol solubilizing the, the the nutrients that they, that they will then uh, serve uh, serve and 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 supply back back into the roots through through their their, their, their connectivity. Um, without this connection, this huge resource is, is is not available. Mycorrhiza fungi is is able to get into spaces where roots can't and and suck water from these spaces even when wilting point is as, as theoretically been been reached. It is, it is, it is, in my view, the most under under um, looked or un underestimated component of the of the whole regenerative ag system. If you do not have this connectivity, you do not have you do not have regenerative agriculture. Yeah, it essentially increases the the root access and something like the surface area. Um, like Lily said, it helps their reach in the soil to access water and nutrients that. Um, for one thing, the, the latter, the nutrients might not even be available, so it can help solubilize some of those for the plant to take up. Uh, but that's just sort of a something of a, a gross oversimplification um, in terms of how dynamic this uh, sort of relationship is. And like Willie says, it's uh, such an important area that we need to look at. Um, and it's, it's, it's still difficult to study to this day. We're still implementing some measures to try to look at this in a more fine-tuned manner, but um, it's like Willie said, if you don't have that, you don't really have a lot of the components of, or the benefits of regenerative ag. And if I could just add the one, 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 of, the, one of the benefits which, which, we, which we don't seem to pay much attention to is the glomalin that is, that is, that is released uh, that, that actually binds your soil particles together and is a great facilitator in, in improving your, your aggregate stability and your aggregation process. Um, just it, it also serves as the uh, communication medium through which the plant signals its particular requirements uh, that it needs at a specific moment in time for its for its 
uh, cycling processes where, where it is synthesizing specific uh, uh, components. So it, 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 it can sw switch on and off saying like sending a message to the to the mycorrhiza now at this moment in time i need some molybdenum so what will happen is the the, the, the molybdenum functioning system will, will will kick into action uh the the microbiology associated with that function will 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 go into action they will they will go the quorum sensing will take place they will they will expand their their their, their um, numbers and they will then do do the functions of solubilizing the the quantity and then it will be transferred back to the back through the through the hyphae system back back into the reeds and so these 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 systems are switched on and off on a daily basis depending on the physiological state of of the uh, uh, plants growing uh, state at, at that moment in time and in, in 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 the next slide, you, you you'll see what we what we mean about what 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 you are actually missing if if you don't have this 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 connectivity. So we we touched on the minerals just a little bit, but let's elaborate more on that. Yeah, if you can if we can just yeah. move to the next slide. Oh, does Zach want to comment on this one at all? Or Zach, you want to? Uh other than just the power of fungi, the, the book Teeming with Microbes is a good introduction to a very digestible introduction into the, the kingdom of fungi, which um, is kind of Earth's internet, to put it generally speaking. Uh, there's yeah. real power to it. And things like mycorrhiza fungi are symbiotic fungi, meaning they're friends. They're friends. They work with the plant, together with the plant. And there is a mutual benefit. Mutual. Um, it's also been said, and I've read in different locations throughout, I guess, my, my own career that over 90% of all terrestrial plants on this planet have an association with the symbiotic fungi, right? Mycorrhiza fungi. So it's really important that we uh, consider its usefulness in working with us. And if I can, if I can just maybe just close the, the, the statement. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we spoke about the, the importance of the micro mineral and nano nanonutrients that is that is that, that we are now actually breeding or, or that uh, the new cultivars are just breeding the, these requirements out of the out of the system as, as non requirements in in the older varieties where, where where these were still required you it, it would be almost impossible for a plant to actually just find the minute amounts of say beryllium or, or chromium that's that's required at that moment in time because these are required in nano amounts and it is only the mycorrhiza components of of the system that can actually mine that at the specific needed time in, of the physiology of the physiological growth stage that the plant is in when it requires those nanonutrients mm -hmm. and these are absolutely vital for the for the for for uh, for the the synthesizing of specific vitamins and 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 and, and phytochemicals that's required for for, for 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 plant health, animal health, and human health. DoorDash for your plant roots. Go to the next one. Again. Okay, well, let's wrap up this question. What, can, can we, can we, we just oh, want yep. to, just to, to, to put in, into perspective, these are, this was, um, uh, if, if you, if you look at, at soil in, in its textbook definition, it, it contains 45% minerals. So, in, 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 and if you calculate, calculate this in the top one foot of an, of an, of an acre, this equates to 730 tons of, of minerals. If we now extract, the, the plant the, the, the plant required minerals in, in, in totality using the total nutrient, nutrient digest method, we get the following quantities as, as, as depicted in, in, in the slide. And you can see there that irrespective of nitrogen, which really is, 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 is derived from, from the atmosphere, if we look at, at, at the phosphorus, the potassium, the calcium, the sulfur, uh, although although we, we said it's only four percent, these are these are essential essential minerals required for 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 plant growth. And if we if you do not have the have the have the connectivity to the to the soil minerals with the mycorrhiza, you 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 will you will not have access to all these and, and because most of this that you see in, in in this slide is is in the unsoluble is in the non-available form. 
But in, in, nature's, in the nature's model, these are available through the proper uh, uh, microbial uh, and, and specifically mycorrhizal uh, connectivity. Yeah, the, the nutrient bank, you look at the values, it's massive. It's absolutely massive. But if you look at what nature does uh, in comparison to what humans have historically done, nature doesn't oversupply anything. It, it utilizes these uh, sort of the, the network that it's developed to obtain what it needs in the minimum amount because it's, a, it's an energy cost to the plant to produce root exudates to acquire those nutrients. So it just does what it needs to get the required amount of micronutrients. Um, and then you, so that's why uh, with, the, with the mineral reserve, it's always massive, it's always huge. Uh, so it's you know, trying to emulate that or, or capture that uh, and sort of apply it to regenerative ag is sort of uh, one of the goals, I think. Yeah, if I can just say that it, from, from all of the above, which, which, we, which we presented today, uh, trying to, uh, trying to describe and identify the, the, the required resources and where, what, what sources of these resources are, it, it, it's obvious that, 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 that nature provides in abundance. And it should be there for each farmer's objective to use as much of these free resources as possible. And that's very, that's exactly what, what regenerative agriculture is all about. I love this test. This is kind of what put me in closer touch with Ward Labs. Uh, as an independent, I saw this test on a customer's you know, farm and it just blew my, blew my mind because conceptually I've always thought that, you know, didn't we all kind of all arise out of this rock that we're spitting on in space? Like, shouldn't everything be there? And this is evidence of that. And this is really exciting to see. And I, I can't wait to track this over three, five, 10 years of time and see what, you know, these numbers do, you know, especially when we're administering these regenerative approaches that are hopefully building soil again are we building more nutrients do we see nutrients dip i mean it's it's just fascinating new territory okay let's wrap up with one more question here and one more set of slides and then we've got some good questions coming in we'll we'll tackle those um, so can you show us some examples of the benefits of um, a regenerative agricultural system working uh, yes, uh, I, I, I have two uh, uh, examples, and, and, and the one is, is a regenerative game farm in, in South Africa, in the, in, in the Karoo, um, where, they, where they use several, uh, and, and this is actually based on the, on the Savory uh, principle, it's, it's, Alan Savory happens to be their, their, their consultant. And they use sheep in, in several groups of, of 200 head in a, in, in a mob grazing pattern over the game farm as a regenerative method. The, the, the building or regeneration or the regeneration versus the loss and degeneration is obviously across the, the, the fence line. You can see on the one side, it's just a loss of energy, loss of water, loss of carbon. Whereas in the, on, on the other side where, you, where you've applied the regenerative principles, you, you are just you are just storing carbon, storing water, and storing energy. It is, it is, it is just amazing. Um, it, a stable farming system with, with, with minimal, minimal inputs and, uh, and, and functioning carbon, water, nitrogen, nutrient, uh, nitrogen and mineral, mineral nutrient cycles is, is what is obviously evident in, 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 in this uh, uh, slide. You want to go to the next one? Or? You can go to the next one. The, the next one is, uh, is, a, is a slide which, which was uh, actually provided to me by, by Dr. Uh, Alan, Alan Williams, where in, in a ranch in, in the Chihuahua Desert in Mexico, uh, they, they, where they've been busy since about 2014, uh, 2015, they, they've implemented regeneration uh, programs, which you can clearly see uh, this is one of the latest slides taken in, taken last year. You can clearly see that that by just by restoring the the, the water cycles in a, in a desert situation, you can actually actually re revive the 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 water cycles. This is, this is one of the most amazing slides that that, that I've ever 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 come across. This is amazing. I think uh, the one that stands out to me is this previous one and what Zach was exactly saying earlier about uh, if you don't store the carbon, you lose it. 
So this is just one of those things where the, the plants and the system will do the work for you. You just have to make sure you don't disturb it and provide everything it needs to, to get that job done. Any final thoughts, Zach? No, just great images. Uh, I love that next image of the Chihuahua Desert because you can really see how the, the hydrological cycle, I mean, that's happening above us, um, which there is a strong correlation with, you know, the more vegetation, the more respiration and the more, more uh, I guess, the hydrology, which is not my wheelhouse, but the hydrology that can be promoted from, you know, the promotion of more vegetation and more uh, respiration from the biology in that soil on the left there. And so it's just a striking image to see um, that really on that fence line like that. I hadn't yeah. noticed that when I had seen that picture previously. So that's stunning. Yeah. Well, I think that wraps us up for slides. Is that correct, Lily? Yeah, I think that that uh, brings us to the conclusion. Um, we do have some good questions here. So I'll just kind of go down the line here and we'll tackle as many of them as we can. Um, I'll start here in the, the question and answer box and then we'll go over to the chat. Um, so first of all, uh, is this being recorded? Yes, I forgot to mention that. This is recorded, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel and then we'll email out the link um, at the end. So you can feel free to revisit this as often as you'd like. Um, and then there were also a couple questions if we're willing to share the presentation and the, the resources in there. Is that okay with you, Willie? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. We'll be sure to get that um, shared with all of you as well. Okay. So let's start with this one. How do you characterize resilience? Um, what i.e. what the units, what experiments can be run to measure it, et cetera, et cetera. To, to measure the what? I'm sorry. Um, resilience. How resilience. How do you measure or, or measure resilience? Well, resilience is, is really the, the ability of nature to, to maintain its functions. Uh, and so the, the, the measure of, of resilience would be the continued um, maintenance of, of, of soil functions uh, as, a, as a very basic sort of a start. Um, so a, a resilient um, uh, environment would, would, would be able to uh, be able to survive under, 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 under difficult uh, conditions. I think the only way to, I mean, I guess, you know, when you talk about like human resilience, we're only, we can only measure that in terms of the obstacle so I think uh, knowing what makes, uh, like you said, like what makes, um, uh, I guess, a crop resilient or a practice resilient, um, making some of those correlations like the microbial analysis, uh, sort of the nutrients, the, uh, the productivity, um, things like that. But it's kind of hard unless you actively see impairments like, you know, uh, pathogens, things like that, deficiencies and how the crop uh, sort of overcomes that. So I don't know. That's a good question. Um, it's sort of a kind of a, Maybe Zach has more, since he has more of a, an eye on some of the, the, the microbial world uh, visually with a lot of his microscopy work. Yeah, I laced that word into this conversation of resilience because I use it a lot in regeneration and recovery. You know, all these R words that all kind of are taking us, to, you know, in sort of a forward thinking direction. And um, I look at resilience and this is a really um, folk extrapolation. I'm kind of a folk agronomist. I'm largely self-taught when it comes to conventional agronomy. And I look at things like soil gains. So I'm not necessarily working with the producers I'm working with just to get the ROI. I mean, that's very important and I'm not trying to um, shorten that, but I'm really wanting to demonstrate soil gains. And when I look at soil, I want to see, you know, year after year, I want to see gains in traditional things like organic matter. I want to see organic matter increase because that tells me I have more water holding capacity. I have more food. I have more of a habitat. And to me, that's extrapolated as resiliency. Absolutely. I myself do a, a humus test where I just do, it's a Lubke Pike humus test. Um, it's a very crude, quick and dirty test. And it gives me kind of a color, gives me a grade of of one soil, just because somebody has, you know, five, six, seven percent organic matter doesn't necessarily mean that it's humus. And so, um, yeah, there's multiple ways that we can uh, we can look at kind of our soil as sort of a battery, 
and what sort of you know um, capacity does it have to provide for the microbiota, which is then what I'm largely looking at in the microscope, qualitatively speaking. Yeah, I guess like from some of the PLFA that we do, we can actually extrapolate from some of that in terms of like uh, sort of the the, the native. Uh, I guess, progressions or things like that, different bacterial versus fungal colonies and uh, what that means in terms of rotations and some of the practices you should be implementing. So it's sort of broad, just sort of like how we're trying to understand soil health now, it's quite broad. Yeah. It's uh, pieces of a whole that we're trying to capture. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think in, in, in our next uh, uh, session, we, we, we will explain the uh, soil tests that, that we uh, incorporate around what around the discussion which we had this morning uh, to measure to, to measure the functions to measure the the the, the, the connectivities uh, to measure the to, to to provide an indication of the total resources that's that that's available and uh, to give an indication of whether these resources uh, can actually be be utilized through the through through the measurements which we which we will which we will have, uh, and also to to provide an indication of, of when it comes to the to the uh, nutrients what what percentage or what is the amount and quantity of the of the solubilization that is created through through the micro through the micro, microbiological systems uh, and the and 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 and, and the mycorrhizal uh, connectivity. So along with that one, um, I think a really good follow-up question is this one. What are the best soil tests to observe a good, healthy soil? What tests do you recommend? You guys touched on that a little, but elaborate just a little more on that. Um, look, I think once again, you, you, you want to measure, measure the, 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 the soil functions. And, and, and you know, some, some, of the, some of the basic soil tests uh, which, which which can be performed out in uh, out on the farm is is also very very under under underutilized. A, a soil in, infiltration test at, at farm level is is worth is worth a hang of a lot more than 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 than, than people tend tend to think. If you can combine a soil inf a soil water infiltration test with an aggregate stability test that that we do in the lab. You will you will have a good indication of of, of what sort of ag aggregate stability you would require to to improve your your soil infiltration from from say from one inches from one inch an hour to six inches an hour, and 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 that is uh, water is is one of the most important components in 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 the system, and we we, we actually also un underestimate the the importance of 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 things like like aggregate stability. Is it, you can see that that I pointed out that that, that the, the first five functions of 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 um, the, the first five soil functions are all are, are all um, underpinned and, and and supported by uh, by aggregate stability. So aggregate stability is is an important one. And then obviously you want to get an over an overview of the of, of your soil microbiology as a as a as a start. So a a, a simple soil respiration test is. Is a, is, a, is a good indication, but it's not the beginning and the end of, of, of soil health. If you want to progress a little bit further, the, 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 the PLFA uh, is, a, is, a, is, a good, uh, is a good is a good progression towards understanding the, the ability of your or the, the availability and the presence of all your soil functional functional groupings. And, and really in, in, in that instance you can actually um, Make make it a lot more sophisticated by incorporating some microscopy work in in, in connect in, in together with 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 the with the uh, uh, PLFA, and then also you you have to make sure that you that you that you have the connectivity. So the so it, it, you have to also have a, a a mycorrhizal connectivity test that will that 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 will prove that you that 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 you have the connectivity which we which we spoke about and it is so important. Because you can you can you can actually identify mycorrhiza in in in, in your soil, but is it actually connected? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I think the the microscopy work, uh, the PLFA work, uh, 
is really, you know, sort of the living parts of the system. Uh, my primary background, I have a lot of microbiology, but primarily it's chemistry and uh, working with uh, growers. Uh, and I guess as a graduate student working on a budget, I'm always, growers always ask, you know, what's the best test to do? Uh, I'm gonna say, well, what's the question? You know, what's the most direct way to answer the question? And uh, I really like a lot of the historically applied soil tests. Um, so DTPA for your micronutrients, it just pulls out something similar to what a plant would pull out. Uh, your exchangeables, calcium, magnesium, things like that. Um, the, rest, the microbial respiration, I think, is a pretty good qualitative indicator of some of the general activity. I mean, it's a broad stroke. Uh, if you have the money uh, and you want to kind of uh, get a more in-depth understanding of the what's going on in your soil, PLFA is great. I mean, it's, it really kind of gives you a, a bird's eye view of what's going on, who's who's at the party, and what's what are they doing. Uh, and so, um, I think that's uh, really useful. Uh, personally, I like a lot of the historically applied tests, uh, like DTPA, ammonium acetate for your exchangeables, things like that, uh, calcio, uh, KCL for your nitrate and ammonium, because a lot of the times, you know, across labs, you might want to compare data, or if you move labs or things like that. Um, that's just me. I, I like uh, a lot of the historically used ones because you can actually maybe compare some of the values a bit better compared to maybe some of the newer tests. Um, but those are, those are things that I'm partial to, but then also coupled with the microbial aspects to get sort of like a, a holistic view of what's going on in your system. Uh, I'm really jealous of Zach and a lot of his work because he actually gets to see, I saw him present some of his microscopy work in Omaha. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, I love microscopy. I think, you know, you're actually seeing what's, you know, you're, you're seeing what's kind of going on at the party. And so, whereas mm -hmm. in a chemi chemical lab, uh, even with PLFA, I can't see a lot of these things. I wish I could. So I think uh, I always, you know, look to, to Zach and even Willie. Willie has a really strong uh, plant microbial microbiology background in terms of their input on a lot of this stuff. So I think in, in, in our presentation next week, we'll be, we'll, we'll be talking a lot, a lot more about the um, uh, tests which we, which we have devised around measuring all these, all the elements we spoke about this morning. Zach, anything to add to your specific tests you'd like to see? Both were great answers. I couldn't agree more. I love just any sort of analog, any sort of feedback from our system. And I love the ones that we can do right out there in the field, like with a soil penetrometer. When I'm going out in soil sampling, I'm taking a penetrometer with me and I'm reading the PSI, the physics of the soil and how compacted it is, which at this time of year, we're coming into kind of the ideal time to get an idea of some baselines of where your soils are at. How deep can your roots go? Can they penetrate past 300 PSI? Um, some argue that say 150 PSI is that sort of that a minimum amount of pressure that a lot of roots can't really penetrate through. So looking at things like that, look using a refractometer even, any sort of testing. And like Patrick said, the traditional testing I love. I've worked closely as a tech with a lab here up in South Dakota. Um, I know how standardized, you know, every 10th sample, there's a check and it has to, you know, really be on point down to the thousandth of PPM on some of those. And so it's, it's a real precise uh, measurement that uses very high tech equipment, just like Ward's using. Um, so any sort of foundational feedback we can get from our system, we, that's how we build. That, we have to build upon that. You can do ag stability in the field with a jar. Just look up some of these extension uh, videos on, you know, YouTube or whatnot. They have a lot of great resources. Just a general marker of what, you know, how you are in your system. The ag stability, I think, is that the aggregate is like the end product, I think, of really good, healthy soil. So that's just something you can kind of do on your own if you want a general idea and just go from there. Absolutely. Okay, there's a kind of a pair of questions that go in hand. So we're going to start um, from the, the crop production side. Uh, what is the single most important thing a corn soy farmer can do to facilitate the carbon cycle? Yeah, well, obviously, <laughs> keep your soil covered because the only way you're going to get you're going to get carbon into your soil is through the root exudates. The, the, that is that, that is that is number one, and and through a diversity of root exudates, you will also create a diversity of of, of microbiology, which we try to explain. Uh, so it, once your crop is off, get in, keep keep your soil covered for 24/7, 365 days a year, 
with a living root, if at all possible, in a diverse situation. That is the best way to build carbon. There is no other way. Like adopting minimal or no-till if you can, I guess. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but all, all, all of that, you know, goes without saying all the, all the principles of, of soil health. But this, the, the, the question was particularly about carbon. So you don't want to break down the carbon. Don't, don't disturb. Um, don't till. But the, the, the best way is through root exudates. We, we know that by, by adding organic matter to, 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 the, uh, to the topsoil will, will also in, improve organic matter. But a lot of, and, and this is the, this is this, the jury is also out on, on this topic. And there's a lot of misconception and a lot of disagreement. How much of the organic material that is that is externally applied actually end up as a as in in a um, in a stable carbon form uh, and my, my view is that 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 it is not as much as what people tend to think it, it is a great source for feeding your 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 soil microbiology uh, maintaining a cover on the on on the, on the soil but the, the true way to fix and, and to get carbon in, in a stable form in, in, into your soil is through is through photosynthesis, root exudates, increase your increase your photosynthetic capacity on your on your soil. Yeah, you don't need to be a carbon chemist to kind of understand a lot of this stuff. Carbon, not all carbon is the same, same as what William Zach said, is that you know the humus is sort of the that stable fraction is really sort of the goal, but you can kind of trust that if you're managing the system. Uh, holistically, uh, with as minimal inputs physically and chemically, um, and sort of relying on a system to do a lot of the work for you, uh, you you could be you you'll more than likely be, will be developing developing a lot of that stable carbon fraction. So, um, yeah, it's just some of my input. My input would be largely from a microbiological perspective, and that's put more of your predatory organisms into the system, put more of your protozoa, put more of your nematodes where you're, you're actually cycling the nutrients, you're opening up that bag of fertilizer, aka the bacteria that are in our soils, yeah. you're opening them up and you're actually accessing those nutrients by having something come and eat it. And then that pulls it up the food system. I mean, real grossly put, that's what I observe in healthy functioning soil ecosystems that I'm working in is, you know, just via light microscopy is those, when those organisms come back into the fold, we see tremendous gains, not only in plant health, but we see gains in soil health. Um, we track those gains with traditional soil tests. Even. Yeah. If, if, if I can just, just come in here, yeah, the, the, um, soil, uh, uh, soil nutrient cycling is really there's there's two distinct different methods or, or ways in which in which these are cycled. The, the one is through the through the system through the process of predation, uh, which you need your your your, your total complement of uh, soil of soil function. Uh, microbial to be present. In other words, you want to speed up the the the, the predation process. And obviously, your 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 bacteria have, for instance, uh, as, as a C2 C2 N ratio of four to one. Your uh, protozoa has a C2 N ratio of anything between fifteen and thirty to one. So for for each one one of the um, uh, units of 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 of, of, of bacteria that that are, that a protozoa would would consume, it it it, it would retain. Only, only uh, the, the 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 carbon, and and it would would release three three units of of, uh, of nitrogen for, for for each unit of of uh, uh, of bacteria that, that it consumes. They, they, uh, we have presentations that that actually give you give you those exact quantities. Stay tuned. And then obviously the the other way is through mineral. Uh, uh, cycling, which which uh, which we try to explain through the through particularly through the the, the presence of of mycorrhiza and, and its helper bacteria. Okay, it looks like we have time for about one more question that that kind of goes hand in hand with that. So unfortunately, we're not going to get to them all. Um, but Zach, William, Patrick, would you guys be willing to share your email addresses in the chat? And then if anyone has sure. They know how to get a hold of you guys. Sure. Okay. Um, so we'll wrap up with this last question. Um, let's see here. So uh, this 
It will understand how regenerative ag works in grazing situations, but it's harder to understand how to make it work in a cropping situation. We grow monocultures to facilitate yields and harvest. So how do you work in diversity and is cover crops in the non-crop season enough? Uh, that, you know, I, I, I find it difficult to, to um, really uh, regard just a cover crop in an in an in an in a season where you, uh, where you're not cropping. In other words, in a portion of the of, of the seasonal year, as as being enough to to uh, do a regenerative uh, job. I'm I'm my personal view about this is that you should on your farm uh, get a rotation going where you have at least a portion of the farm in a rotational system for one or, one or two or possibly even three years. And, with, and, and within that regenerative uh, uh, area, you, 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 I've heard of farmers saying, you know, that I'm actually making more money out of my re regeneration uh, uh, area than, than I am from, from my cropping area. Because now I can bring in, I can bring in my animal components, which, which is a whole range. It's, it, it, it's not only uh, animal, it, it's not only a beef, it's, 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 it's hogs, it's turkeys, it's, it's, it's um, uh, laying hens. Uh, uh, and and, and, and you, you, if you really do the system properly and you, and, and, and you, you, you build your, your farm plan around a, a regenerative period that I'm going to take this piece of land out and I'm just going to do a, do a regeneration and bring it into production when I'm happy with it, I think will, m makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, and, and I know that, 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 that I have conflicting uh, views about this. Uh, whereas you only have, you, 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 you plant your corn and when your corn's off, you, 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 you then put a cover crop on, that's great. If, if you can do nothing else, that's, 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 that's a hell of a lot better than, than just leaving it, leaving it fell out. But the mixes are the best though. Oh, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's, uh, what, you know, that's uh, not, not all people have the, you know, um, have the ability to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And then also incorporating animals is be, becomes a problem for certain people as well. Mm -hmm. Diversity, diversity, diversity. So where we focus, where we're starting to focus more collectively on the polyculture above ground, I'm really adamant about the polyculture below ground and promoting that competitive inhibition, which is that idea that we put so many things in place and let them sort it out. Let them, Absolutely. I'm giving them an identity, but, these but, organisms but, themselves. But, but Zach, you, 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 you can't create diversity below ground if you don't create it above ground. Correct. Yep. And I think the, mer the marrying of the two, I think that's how we get there faster. And that's my humble opinion, because this is humbling work. Absolutely. Okay, we have a couple minutes. I'm going to tackle one more quick question here um, related to cropping systems. It is challenging to implement soil health practices in a flood irrigated operation. We are using manure, reduced tillage, and crop rotation. Occasionally, we need to employ full tillage. Any thoughts? Mm. Tillage is the hard part. Yeah, tillage is the hard part. Yeah, because it's, it's... you're basically tearing down the city that's built below yeah. ground. Mm -hmm. Zach, have you got any, any views? I mean, I would start investigating what, what's the manure source, um, what's the quality of that manure, you know, is it poultry, is it cattle, is it aged, is it fresh, um, what was the application rate, you know, we can end up having some salt issues a, a lot of times. Uh, we can also just get a real big pulse of nitrates in those issues, uh, or, you know, with a lot of those poultry litters that just promotes, makes more work for ourselves. It's like watering our lawn so we can mow it. I mean, we just end up putting more of that real fast weedy type food into our systems when we overuse those sorts of inputs. And so um, in looking at that, again, looking at it in a microscope would allow us to look at the, the habitat of that soil or doing a PLFA would allow us to see who's, who's still there. And I mean, I would, 
want to investigate pre and post tillage, you know, who was there before tillage and then after tillage. And, and then ultimately, what can we put back? Because we still have to do what we got to do. I mean, I'm not against tillage myself. I work with farmers where we have to till. We're just too wet. And, um, and maybe that's, you know, um, yeah, rubs some people the wrong way. But I think that adaptation is the key for us all. And so we have to adapt to our system. Yeah. I think we'd be, we'd be more, than, more than willing to, to assist the, 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 the person who asked this question. You know, but if, if he gives us a little bit more inform, information, I think between the three of us, we can, we can, we can give, him, give him a sort of a, a direction to move in. Yeah, yes. I think from what I understand, the hard part with the, uh, with the no-till system, the soil health is with flood irrigating is you get really great infiltration. So you can't, you can't flood the field, you know? So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you have to might maybe modify the system, but like Willie said, we'd be more than willing to work with this person uh, with more information. We're always happy to, to help with these things. Perfect. Well, I think that's a great way to bring this to a close. Um, I apologize for not getting to all of the questions. You guys had some really good ones that we weren't able to answer today. Um, but we do have another webinar series in two weeks, or another part to the series in two weeks. I believe the date is April 12th. Is that right? Yes. It's exactly two weeks from right now. Um, and it is a separate link to register. So I'll send that out when I, when I share the recording. So make sure to, to sign up and join us for part two. Um, otherwise, I've put Zach's email, Patrick's email, Willie's email, and the lab phone number there. So feel free to give us a call. Um, with any of your questions in the meantime, we're, we're happy to talk through them with you all. But other than that, thank you all so much for being here and for your interest in soil health and, and the knowledge that these folks have to share. So thanks, everyone, and hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, everybody have a good week. Yeah, thanks, everyone. This was great. Uh, and we're always around to help. That's what we're there for. <laughs> the friendly neighborhood soil scientist. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.